All right, let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Heal me, full of grace, the Lord is with me. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Anne and Jotham, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, Lori, for the introduction. It is a blessing to be here with all of you. And my hope is to have some time of speaking, offer an opportunity for questions, and then have a break. We'll probably do that depending on how long things go with uh, my speaking and then questions. And we will do that a couple times uh, before we get to noon and we break for the meal. So up front, I want to tell you, I don't, I'm not an expert on living in the divine will. I have studied the divine will. Um, but perhaps I'm going to rely upon a synthesis of ideas and also my own experience. Uh, because I think uh, living in the divine will, on one hand, it may seem complicated because there are volumes of readings. And there are excellent resources being made available, including uh, Daniel's resource that's available to you here. It's a wonderful compilation and synthesis of ideas and uh, from the prior revelations of uh, Louisa Ticaretta, Servant of God, Louisa. Um, and also the growing body of experience that people have and that we all are experiencing by being consciously choosing to live in the divine will. So all of this contributes to the knowledge of and the grace to live in the divine will. So again, I'm not an expert, uh, but I know all that is in simplicity to begin, as we know, is that we must desire to live in the divine will. Our desire is where God begins and he works then in the action of our own will. Secondly, my hope is to compliment uh, Daniel on what his work has been last night and what he wills to continue to do into this afternoon. I hope I don't speak what he has already planned to speak. I don't know what he's going to say, so please forgive me if I do. But redundancy is part of life, and we have things repeated, it helps us remember. So, Father, uh, being a professor, I know he knows that. By the way, I'm a teacher too, so uh, repeating things is always a benefit. So I'll probably repeat, uh, but my desire is to compliment what he is doing, and that we may hopefully give each of us respective information that you will not hear from the other. I'd like to begin by talking about a servant of God, Sister Lucia, and going through her life in a little more detail. I know there are several of you here who perhaps this is the very introduction to the divine will and the grace of the divine will, and you perhaps were invited by someone or saw the fire and were inspired to say, I'd like to come to that. Or you know somebody who is interested in living the divine will, uh, or is practicing maybe a divine will cynical, and you're interested in feeling drawn. So I'd like to give those persons more, and perhaps those who are more experienced or have studied more, more information, I hope. So the servant of God, this is Louisa Picaretta. Again, the servant of God, that means her process leading toward the application and possible canonization is underway. Her cause has been introduced. So being a servant of God means that she lived on first study and first glance of the church in an organized and systematic way she lived heroically, that she practiced virtues in a heroic way and followed God in a, well, a way that was looked upon and deemed to be heroic. And so her life continues under examination, including all the writings of living in divine will. So, uh, so she's called servant of God officially by the church. She's born in the city of Carato in the province of Bari, Italy. So it'd be in the eastern part of the boot of Italy in the morning of April 23rd, 1865. 
She was born on what is called Low Sunday in the extraordinary form. That is the Sunday after Easter Sunday. We call this now the second Sunday of Easter or the Sunday of Divine Mercy. She was born on Divine Mercy Sunday, as we call it in our time, 1865. She was baptized the same afternoon, which was common uh, at that time. She lived her whole life there, and there she died a holy death on March 4th, 1947. 1947. She lived uh, 82 years. She was born to Mrs. Rosa Tarantino and Mr. Vito Nicola Picaretta. And Nic uh, Vito worked for a property of the Master Rogrilli family. And when Louisa was little, uh, she was bashful, she was timid, uh, a bit shy. Nevertheless, she was lively and she had a joyful spirit. She would be like other children that we know, perhaps your children. She would love to run and skip and play. And she herself says she used to play pranks and have jokes that were common in her life as a young girl. When she was nine years old, again on Low Sunday, this would have been in 1874, Sunday after Easter, she received her first Holy Communion. And on the same day, she also received the Sacrament of Confirmation. And that was not uncommon at that time that that could happen. Since she was very little, she showed a strong desire to spend long periods of time in prayer and meditation. Uh, this is a sign of particular graces, not that any child uh, being drawn to prayer, that is a very good thing, uh, but it is common when our Lord may set someone apart that He is giving graces to draw them to be close to Him so as to prepare their hearts for the choice of the special grace that would come. So she demonstrates some marks of this. At the basis of her interior life, was her burning love for the suffering of Jesus and his passion, and as a prisoner of love in the Holy Eucharist. So she was giving an interior insight, a special grace, to come to contemplate the power of the divine acting through the humanity of Jesus and his passion, and also the power of the divine hidden behind the Holy Eucharist. And under Pope Benedict, we have the beautiful uh, writing of the love of Jesus, and the Eucharist is the love of Jesus. She had a mature and solid devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and her parents paid little attention to her hobbies until she began to manifest mysterious illness that forced her to remain bed district ridden. The doctors, unable to find a cause and diagnose her, suggested the visit of a priest, and they were amazed at the sign of the cross that Louisa recovered from her usual state, which was referred to her bed and ridden state uh, later in her writings. Around the age of 18, while working in her room, she was doing the meditation on the Passion of our Lord Jesus. Her heart fell so oppressed by pain that she could not breathe. Fearing that something was about to happen to her, she went to the balcony to distract herself. The street, she noticed, as she wrote later, was crowded with people and who were leading Jesus carrying the cross. She saw him, Jesus, sad and oppressed, his face dripping with blood. His look was so pitiable that the very stones were moved, so she perceived. Jesus then raised his eyes toward her, as if asking her for her help, saying, Soul, help me. Our Lord was giving her this mystical experience to draw her even more to the beautiful mystery uh, of which he would lead her in the days and years ahead. Soul, help me. Louise went back into her room, then her heart broken for the sorrow. She burst into tears and said to Jesus, as she reported, Oh, how you are suffering, my good Jesus. If only I could help you and free you from those rabid wolves, or at least suffer your pains, your sorrows, and your fatigues in your place, and so give you the greatest relief. Yes, my good Jesus, make me suffer too, because it is not right for you to suffer so much for love of me that I, a sinner, do not suffer anything for you. From then on, as she continued repeating her fiat, that is, let it be to me as you will, let it be done. The period that she spent in bed became ever more frequent until she arrived to complete immobility. And this situation, this experience lasted for 62 years. In this small prison, that is the prison of her bed, Jesus made known to her the great desire of his heart, that man lives and exists, is sustained in his will, so that he returns to the order, the place and the purpose for which he was created by God. That is the purpose. He taught us to ask for in the Lord's Prayer, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thus, Jesus entrusted Louisa with wonderful truths about living in the divine will, 
so that she, as depository and secretary of the treasures of the divine will, would make known the eternal decree of the coming of his kingdom in the church and in the whole world. So again, if we might uh, understand this in, a, in perhaps different words. Uh, so when, when God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, one God and three divine persons, distinct persons, thank you, when God within himself looked out of himself and willed to create, he willed to create and put into action his will. And by the act of his will, all that is outside of him and is created, then is all part of the action of his will. So God is the uncreated creator, the unmoved mover, and he is the sustainer of all that is created. And his will has an order and a design that is in accord with his own inner divine wisdom and in accord with his own inner love, which always has purpose in its act, in its action. Now the key, one of the keys to having, to keeping the living the divine will very simple is that the act of the divine will is continuing. His will did not simply act and then stop. His act of will from the moment of creation is continuing in act. It's continuing. And it's like in uh, another place where it's a bit like a river flowing down the stream. It's moving. It's continuing acting, going toward the end. So God's will has flowed forth from him, and it is to come back to him. It's going forth. It's the procession. Forth from him, and then back to him. Okay? So, if we think of this then, what happened with Adam and Eve, as I alluded to in the sermon this morning. So, the will, the, the individual human will... In Adam and Eve uh, were made to be within the divine will. The act of the divine will is being created. Uh, Adam and Eve's individual wills were created by God and reflection and like his own will. And they were made, each one of us too, and being made in descendants of Adam and Eve, our own unique and personal will is made to live within the divine will, receiving the love of God into our own life, into our own soul, being loved by God in his will. His will loving, because that's what His will does. And then when we are loved by God in the act of His will, we receive His love, and by His love, we love God back. And we love all of God's works back. We love God by and within the act of His own will. And that pleases God. So this is, to keep it quite forthright, uh, that, is what is, that is what God has in mind. That's what He wills to have happen. I'm going to get into, I think, in my next talk, of, of the deformity or the, the defect of resisting or being against God's will in all its various ways. And I alluded already, as I said, to the, the great sin of original sin and uh, the, the personal sins and how opposing God's will in its all different forms leads to all sorts of chaos in inner human experience and in relationships between God uh, and one another in the human sphere and then in the world. So all, all this chaos and depravity and misery and suffering is the, the consequence of being apart from the peace and the grace and the act of the divine one. So St. Hannibal, her spiritual director, you know, she was quite blessed by our Lord. Our Lord took good care of her, giving her one who is now a saint, uh, and we know as a saint, for her spiritual director. He wrote and commented on this, this solitary soul is a most pure virgin, holy of God, who appears to be the object of singular predilection of Jesus, the divine Redeemer. It seems that our Lord, who century after century increases the wonders of his love more and more, wanted to make of this virgin with no education, whom he calls the littlest one that he found on earth, the instrument of a mission so sublime that no other can be compared to it. That is, the triumph of the divine will upon the whole earth, in conformity with what is said in the Our Father, Fiat Volotas Tua, Sicut in Cielo et in Terra. Thy will be done on, in heaven as, on earth as it is in heaven. So, we see that our Lord will to give the knowledge of this and the invitation to live in this grace uh, and the insight into it for our time. I want to pause here for a second and to help us understand a little bit of growing in living in the divine will. So the, the first step is we clearly understand to live in the divine will as a desire. 
want to do it. Want to do it. If one does not desire it, immediately there is an impediment in one's own human will. And God will not force anyone who doesn't want to, to do something. So if we're willing to do it, that is the first step for the will to say yes. We're willing. We're willing. And many times we need this in our own individual personal life when we're dealing with one thing or another. Perhaps it's a, uh, a misery, a trial, a sickness, or a tragedy, or, or um, um, our own possibility of happiness. We kind of like, we can choose between different good things and different things that we're, we, we think will be reasonably happy, but our Lord perhaps has a preference. I prefer that you do this. And we say, Lord, your will be done. Your will. What is your will? May your will be done. Well, we need to go with Jesus in the garden at times, especially when it's very difficult or when we're not sure what to discern. We go to Jesus when he's suffering and we say, Father, not my will but yours be done. We enter into our Lord's heart in the act of his human will and our own will then can be rectified and be given light. Be given light. Now, that's the other thing, the quality of this, if we think of our, maybe just use this as an analogy here in this uh, wonderful building, if we were here at midnight, early this morning, we're on May 11th, let's say we were here at 12.01 a.m. on May 11th, it would have been really dark. Right, Lori? Unless they had all the lights on here, right? But otherwise, outside, there's no sun. Maybe we could see the moon, perhaps, if it was out last night. We could see it was very dark. So we try to look around here, and we say, let's walk around, and you're hitting and stumbling into all the chairs, and probably banging your head on the posts, and so on. It's kind of a walking disaster trying to get around without any light, without being able to see. Then eventually your eyes may adjust and you look very closely, I see this, I see that. But then all of a sudden, you know, it comes around 5 in the morning. The light starts coming over the horizon. And all of a sudden you can see, oh, I can see things here. And you begin to see better, oh, I can walk through these aisles here. And all of a sudden the light comes up and then dawn comes, I can see even better. And you, the light comes up and now it's maybe like this now. I can look and see all the details and the rafters and all the different things. That's what living in the divine will and living in this grace is like in this.